I was in a dimly lit room in Vegas, CES 2014. I was in the middle of a meeting with a shady character. Min Lang Tan and I were sitting across from each other on couches. I had recently given the Razor Blade 14 2013 edition a mostly positive review, but I was in the middle of laying into him about how frustrating that notebook had been for me because I thought it was basically perfect if it wasn't for the TN screen. Midway through, he kind of started smiling, and then finally he said, okay, so Linus, then what you're saying is that if I fix the screen for you in the next iteration, you'll call it perfect on camera? Not being able to think of anything else I wanted changed, I agreed. Let's find out if I held up my end of the bargain. Is the Razorblade 2014 perfect? With its power loss protection, affordability, and performance, the SP920 from ADATA makes upgrading to an SSD remarkably safe and simple. So here is my review of the 2014 Blade 14. And apart from my customary complaint that Razer really needs to fix their bloody product naming scheme, I may have to give this my first ever Editor's Choice Award. It's expensive, but it's a truly remarkable piece of technology. On top of ditching the rubbish panel type, Razer quadrupled the pixel count to an extremely sharp 3200 by 1800, made it a 10 point multi-touch screen, and they improved the core specs of it as well. So we're getting an upgrade to a fourth gen Core i7-4702HQ quad core with hyper-threading. We're getting an upgrade to a GTX 870M with three gigs of GDDR5 memory, which is remarkable given the form factor. That's anywhere from 60 to 100% faster in real world games versus the last gen Blade 14. And as long as it's running at full speed, which amazingly on a flat surface it does, we're getting 2.5 gigahertz on the VRAM and a slightly boosted over base 967 megahertz on the GPU in heaven with the graphics core running at 82 degrees and the CPU running at 77 degrees. On battery, these values dip a little bit down to around 875 megahertz core and two gigahertz RAM, but I guess that's to help conserve battery life. Although I still got a very respectable if not overwhelming, 45 minutes of continuous 3D use out of it. Not bad considering its size. All right, so let's move on to the physical overview. The power brick is incredibly small for a 150 watt, just like last time, and that's about it for accessories. On to the machine. It features an aluminum unibody construction that gives off a definite Apple would make notebooks like this if they were cool vibe that also assists with cooling and keeps it extremely light at just under four and a half pounds or about two kilos. It's got an illuminated razor logo on the back with subtle sort of accent bumps and basically it looks just like the last blade 14 which means it is still beautiful. The bottom has two cooling intakes and two rubber feet to keep the notebook from sliding around. Then moving to the left side we've got power in two USB three ports and a headphone slash microphone combo jack. Finally on the right is a Kensington lock and HDMI output and another USB 3 port, which brings us around to the top. The trackpad has a very pleasing finish and satisfyingly clicky, if a little bit narrow, dedicated left and right buttons. The speakers are unhindered by obstructions and sound loud, even if they're not particularly deep and boomy. The power button sits below the screen above the exhaust that spits hot air out above the keyboard here and that keyboard. Razer has outdone themselves here. The layout is spacious and nearly perfect. Every key is programmable. The backlight has an extravagant 20 levels of illumination and the keys have a satisfying tactile clickiness that is unlike any other chiclet type notebook that I have ever used. It is outstanding. Now, I know I already kind of awarded it an editor's choice, but that doesn't mean I'm not gonna ask for a few things to be improved in the next revision. And number one is actually related to the next stop in our tour, the screen. The resolution makes it super sharp whenever text scales correctly and colors and viewing angles of the screen are much better than the last chip, like worlds better but there's still a noticeable color shift when viewing off center. And although it makes up for it somewhat with an incredibly bright backlight and therefore a very solid contrast ratio, black levels of this screen are not as deep as I'd like, especially for use in a dimly lit room. Number two, Razer, the memory is soldered on and you only gave us eight gigs. 
That's good enough for today, but what about tomorrow? I regularly use six gigs of RAM on my desktop just browsing the web. The 256 gig SKU and up need to have 16 gigs of RAM for this machine to last long enough to justify the sticker price, especially if it's not gonna be upgradable. And number three, well, I think we got just enough USB 3 ports, and while I appreciate the upgrade to Intel Solid 7260 AC wireless solution, I don't think a gaming machine is complete without an Ethernet port, even if it requires an adapter or something. And then while we're at it, I would have much rather seen Mini DisplayPort in the place of HDMI out due to its higher resolution support and ability to be inexpensively adapted to anything else. But that's it. That's all I got. It's an engineering marvel. I mean, out of my measly four complaints, one of them could have been resolved with a $25 USB Ethernet adapter, a trivial amount of money for anyone buying a Blade 14. Which I guess leads into one more like extra bonus criticism. One that's very different from the others and that I don't expect Razer to be able to fix it anytime soon. The Blade 14 is very, very expensive. I don't have to like it, but I do understand it, and that's the reason why I'm not taking its Editor's Choice Award away for costing as much as my car for a 512 gig model. For the same price, you can of course get a much more powerful gaming desktop or even a much more powerful gaming notebook, but this is a luxury item that a lot of R&D went into, so someone has to pay those engineers, and that's why it costs this much. Sadly, it's too expensive for my tastes, but for affluent gamers who want something beautifully crafted that they can take on the road with them, this notebook will absolutely annihilate similarly crafted machines like Apple's 13-inch MacBook Pro. So here's the conclusion. With network streaming gaming technology advancing so quickly right now, how long-lived thin and light gaming notebooks will be as a category remains to be seen. But one thing's for sure in my mind, right now it's alive, and this one rules the roost. If you can afford one, I wholeheartedly recommend the Blade 14 2014. Nothing is perfect, so I'm reneging on that deal where I have to call it perfect, but I will say it's the first notebook I've ever seen that just plain doesn't feel like a compromise in any way. It's thin, light, beautiful, and powerful, and it's my new favorite. Well done, Razer. Thank you guys very much for watching. Like this video if you liked it, dislike it if you disliked it. Leave a comment under the video letting me know what you think of the Razer Blade 2014. If you think that Razer should really let me keep this instead of making me send it back, which is making me very, very sad right now as I try to finish this review. Anyway, in the video description, you can check out the support link, guys, where you can buy cool t-shirts like this to maybe help me afford a Razer Blade 2014. You can also uh, give us a monthly contribution if you love our content. And if you don't want to give us anything directly, which is great, you can change your Amazon bookmark to one with our affiliate code. We'll get a small kickback whenever you buy stuff that you already would have been buying anyway. So that's another awesome way of helping us out, and we appreciate it. Thank you very much for watching once more. And as always, don't forget to subscribe to Linus Tech Tips if you haven't already.